What is up, guys? Today is another day, and I hope you're having a wonderful week. And I want to go over nature versus nurture in this episode. Now, this used to be a heavily debated topic, but it's not so much anymore because most people come to the conclusion that both the nature and nurture play a part in our development and shapes who we are and what we become. So not only am I going to go over nature and nurture, but I also want to dive into the deep, dark tale of the three identical strangers. I'm your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you are listening to What the Psychology. So the expression of nature versus nurture, it pretty much is the question of how much of a person's characteristics are formed by either one. So technically, this debate has been argued over a long time, and most people acknowledge that both play a part in how we develop psychologically, how our personality is developed, things like that. So biological factors or nature is more like genetics, whereas nurture is more like the environment, the upbringing of people, attachment theories, things like that. A lot of scientists have shown that this relationship between nature versus nurture is very complicated, but both factors account for many ways that we differ from each other and how we are similar. So a lot of people don't really like nature and nurture. They usually use genetics and environment to describe the two because the environment does include a broader range of experiences than just the nurturing they receive from their caregivers. There are also many theories on how long does our personality take place, like by what age. There's also attachment theory, which is usually by the age of five. And even to further explore attachment theory, there isn't much research on the question of how that attachment theory affects if things change. There are different attachment theories, which is something we will go over in the future. But say that you are securely attached to your caregiver, let's say your your father, okay? And this means that you are raised in a very nurturing environment. You know, you get attention, you get love, you get things like that. And you are a very secure individual. And attachment is also, it's defined by the response that the caregivers have to their children, to the child, and how nurturing they are. That's like kind of the basics. So say you grow up. And you, by the age of five, you're securely attached because that's what the theory usually brings us to. And let's say around seven or eight, said caregiver is abusive and things like that. They are no longer nurturing and loving. So how does that secure attachment play when it comes to that relationship? Does the secure attachment make you more attached to the person where... You write off the abuse or um, like an unhealthy relationship. Does that influence you accepting abuse from others? Getting into like domestic type of situations in relationships. There are just many questions when it comes to that personally. But that would be the nurture aspect. How were you raised? How was the home? What was your attachment to your parents? Which... Like I said, well, we'll, maybe we'll go into attachment theory in the next episode because I strongly believe in attachment theory. I don't believe in all things of the theory and I have a lot of questions, but maybe that's just my curious mind to be like, oh, are we really set at the age of five of what our personality is going to be or how attached we are to our parents? And of course, we know life circumstances happen. How does that affect things? When it comes to nature, that is the biological nature. So that can be things you've inherited from your parents. That could be further generations. 
So a person's biological nature can affect a person's experience of the environment. So for example, let's say that you have a genetic disposition, so it's kind of like inherited. Doesn't mean you act on it, but as we know, the environment can affect that in this example. So you have a genetic disposition towards aggressiveness, which is a particular trait. Let's say that you receive negative reactions from parents and others. So then you are more likely to have those same reactions in the future to such life experiences. Now, let's say that you grow up in maybe a more secure, attached environment, more inclination toward warmth and sociability, and that you probably seek out more positive social responses from peers and that you react to life experiences more positively. So life experiences in turn reinforce an individual's initial tendencies. So nurture or life experience more generally may also modify the effects of nature. So kind of backwards to what we were just saying, let's say that a naturally bright child receives encouragement access to quality education, and opportunities for achievement, then they may turn out better versus someone who doesn't have access to those things. And they, they may end up in a lower quality type of life. Now, that's not a blanket statement to say, oh, everyone that grows up in a great home ends up great, or everyone in a bad home ends up bad, or, you know... I think we do have a personal responsibility, personal things in order to achieve things. But people that are growing up in a more warm environment or even access to money have access to more things. Henceforth, they have access to more quality education. And so for those that are a little bit more behind, they might just have to run the race a little bit harder to get there. Now let's talk about epigenetics. Um, So... Epigenetics, this is the science of modifications and how genes are expressed. This is kind of like what I was talking about. But epigenetics is more like the thing. So the things you inherit, right? They do not override the important influence of genes in general. But they do constitute additional ways in which that influence is filtered through the nurture or environment. So... Let's, let's talk about this in a more medical sense. A lot of us, probably all of us, have been to the doctor. And of course, they ask us, give us your family history, your family medical history. And that is because a lot of those diseases have some genetic disposition to them. So we'll say like heart disease and diabetes and many other types of diseases. So let's take diabetes, for example. Diabetes runs in my family. I, my grandmother had type 2, I believe. Um, so not heavily, but it, it does run in the family. We know heart disease. We're pretty sure that runs in the family as well. So if I were to be a kind of where I'm at now, I'm not as much of a healthy individual. I'm definitely working on that. But say I'm extremely unhealthy and I let myself go when it comes to weight and when it comes to health, when it comes to activity, uh, like going to the gym and exercise, and I just eat everything I want to. I don't have any nutrient value into my food, right? I eat all the sugar, all this and that, have all the coffees I want, right? Since I already have the genetic disposition to diabetes, my chances are higher to get diabetes. Now, let's say because of that genetic disposition, I'm a healthy individual. I have a healthy weight, have a healthy diet, have a healthy exercise plan. I watch what I eat. I take in more veggies, more nutrients, things like that. My genetic disposition to getting diabetes, although it is still more likely for me to get it versus someone who does not have the genetic disposition of it. If my environment and what I am nurturing in my body, such as the the exercise and what I'm eating, my likelihood of getting diabetes or developing diabetes is less likely. This also goes to show that 
if you're living an unhealthy lifestyle, regardless if you have a genetic disposition or not, you could still develop diabetes. It's just saying that those that have a genetic disposition are more likely to develop it, especially if they're living a more unhealthy lifestyle. Let's go back to an earlier episode, okay, when we talked about schizophrenia. One of the things we talked about in schizophrenia is that about 1%, I believe it's like 1% of the population have schizophrenia. And of course, we talked about the good and the bad about schizophrenia, um, how the majority do not have violent tendencies or, or violent things that happen, uh, which is usually portrayed. But we also talked about the genetic disposition. So 1% of the population has schizophrenia, and about 1% of the population will get schizophrenia, right? That's what the statistics tell us. However, if I have a parent who has schizophrenia, my genetic disposition of schizophrenia is now 10% versus 1% of the general population. So there are some mental health illnesses that we know have a genetic predisposition to them. Another very interesting study that I read a long time ago was about antisocial personality disorder or as people know, a psychopath or sociopath, that I think it was in er, in teens or early adults, their likelihood of developing a anti-personality disorder. They did a study that about 50% was a genetic disposition and about 49.9% was environmental. So cut 50-50 there. So it's it's very interesting when you talk about this debate and which which one comes first, the chicken or the egg. That's always like kind of the discussion with nature versus nurture. But the truth is they both play a part. Now let's talk about how old this debate is because this debate, it goes way back thousands of years to ancient Greek. And in ancient Greek, they were theorizing about the causes of our personality and now we know during the modern era, theories emphasize the role of either learning and experience or biological nature. We know this has risen and fallen in prominence. We know genetics because more information is learned about genetics every year. And the more we get into like DNA and things like that, we know that there's an increase, increasing acknowledgement that it is an important part of it, but not exclusive. And we know that there is also influence on individual differences in the later 20th century and beyond. So nature versus nurture, this actually was in a book. Um, It was used by an English scientist, Francis Galton, in 1874 when he published the book English Men of Science, Their Nature and Nurture. So this argued that inherited factors were responsible for intelligence and other characteristics. Like we said, uh, we talked about genetic disposition and genetic determination. So genetic determination just emphasizes the importance of an individual's nature in development. So this is like the, the one extreme that genetics is largely or totally responsible for individual's background, their personality, their behavior, things like that. Also, biological determination is also viewed And then on the total other sphere or the other spectrum, the opposite extreme of this is called the blank slate or tabula rasa view in psychology. And this is just emphasizes the importance of nurture and the environment. And this was notably described by English philosopher John Locke in the 1600s. And it proposed that individuals are born with a mind like an unmarked chalkboard and that its contents are based on experience and learning. But we do know that in the 20th century, major branches of psychology propose that both have a role in development, rather than just nature, or rather than just nurture. And this kind of started with, like, we talked about Freud. This was in human development. This included Freudian psychoanalysts and behaviorism, Um, They believe that it was a bit of both. So that's kind of how that started and how it developed in terms. So I want to talk about twins. Uh, Yeah, this seems like we're taking a whole other turn here. But there have been a lot of twin studies. And 
unfortunately, that's kind of the tale we're going to go into with the three identical strangers. But <laughs> these studies have been very influential when it comes to nature versus nurture and trying to prove one or the other, which it actually kind of proves both. So let's talk about the type of twins and let's talk about how twins develop and how they're created. Okay, so we're going to go back to biology 101, but a lot of this really isn't biology 101. Depending on your school, where you went to, definitely in high school, if you went to in a Bible Belt, they probably didn't really teach about fertilization and things like this and that, whatever. Um, they definitely didn't really talk about how twins were formed. So we're going to talk about that. So identical twins, we call those monozygotic twins. So they share the same genetic code. So identical twins happens when you have the female egg and the male sperm. The male sperm fertilizes the female egg becomes a zygote, right? What happens is that initial egg splits into its whole separate egg. And then, so you have one fertilized egg that just miraculously splits on its own to form another human being, okay? So fraternal twins, these are, they call it dizygotic twins, and these share about 50% of the same genes. Some say about 60%. And they're pretty much like siblings. So what happens with dizygotic twins, how they develop, how they form. Typically what happens in ovulation, so female reproductive menstrual cycle. Um, it's about, what, 14 days after the first day of your menstrual cycle? You know, that time we were, where we where we bleed and our, our uterus just wants to kill us. Um, <laughs> so about 14 days from that first day is like your ovulation. Usually what happens is we drop one egg, hoping it gets fertilized, right? And if it doesn't, of course, then we have menstruation. If it gets fertilized, then we're obviously pregnant. So what happens, typically we only drop one egg a month or one egg a cycle in ovulation. Now, how fraternal twins or dizygotic twins typically develop is a condition. It's like, it makes it sound like a disease, but it's, it's honestly like a genetic thing. It has been determined to be a genetic trait passed down. And it's called hyperovulation. All that means is you drop more than one egg a month. It can be um, every single month. It could be, I have a friend who it's like every other month, like one one side of their ovary drops two eggs, and then uh, the next cycle, the other ovary only drops one. So it really dep depends how that is played out. But what happens is you have two separate eggs, then they are fertilized by two separate sperm. Now, if a lot of you like me in high school, when you got off of school at 4 p.m., you would turn on the TV and you would be watching all them crazy dramatic shows like The Maury Show, Jerry Springer, Steve Wilkos, Dr. Phil, those types. Now, if you ever watched Maury, there would be times where there would be a woman pregnant with twins with two separate baby fathers. That is a case of fraternal twins or dizygotic twins because you have sperm from two separate males it doesn't always have to be two separate males. It's whoever you're having intercourse with, obviously, that have fertilized two separate eggs, developing two separate humans that are more like siblings. So identical, one egg, one sperm, the egg splits. Complete identical genetic code. Fraternal, two different eggs, two different sperm, two different humans that are more like siblings. So they have shown that there is a little bit of variation in in certain traits like extrovertism so like me i'm very extroverted they that they say that that is explained by genetics in part by analyzing how similar identical twins are on that trait compared to fraternal twins which of course we know that those studies have limitations and it also depends on the population and such like that but they have done studies that Identical twins are both more likely to have the same, either they're both extroverted or both introverted, 
Versus fraternal twins, you can have more, one that's extroverted and one that's introverted. That's kind of like what these studies are saying. Um, we do know that other psy psychological traits are more heritable than others. So, for instance, we know that autism appears to be more inherited than depression. But we know that psychological traits are shaped by a balance of both genetic and non-genetic factors. So it brings up the question like, is mental illness due to genes or in the environment? Well, it depends on, on the mental illness. It depends on the conditions of the environment. There's always, even with like antisocial personality disorder, whenever we see serial killers that we know are eventually diagnosed with that, we wonder, okay, is it genetic or do they meet, it used to be a triad um, of traits of a psychopath. So farming animals, bedwetting, and lack of empathy. Of course, they've kind of ruled out the bedwetting part, but are those things genetic or are they environmental? When you read or you hear or listen to a podcast of some of the stories of serial killers that are diagnosed with this you hear things of like, oh, they had a horrible mother or they had a brain injury, head trauma. So those are environmental things. So which which one is it? And that's the argument that usually it can be both. It can be either or. Uh, like I said, we know autism, anxiety disorders, depression, and schizophrenia can all be attributed to genetic differences. But not all of that risk is genetic. We know that life experiences such as early life abuse or neglect can also affect the risk of mental illness. Some individuals based on their genetics are likely more susceptible to environmental effects than others. So then we talk about personality. Is personality a genetic thing or is it environmental? <laughs> like anything, it, they say it's partly heritable. So research does suggest that less than half of the difference between people on measures of personality traits can be attributed to genes. One recent overall measurement was about 40%. And then non-genetic factors appear to be responsible for an equal or greater portion of personality differences between individuals. So some theorize that the social roles of people adopt and invest in as they mature are among the most important non-genetic factors in personality development. So all we're saying is that the debate is pretty much that they both play a part. There are some things where one or the other is more um, dominant, but typically they both play a role. Um, let's see, what else? I want to really get into... Some some of the more some of some things that attribute to these. We know that there are other theories besides like the attachment theory that attribute more emphasis on nature or nurture. So one of these is a nativist theory involving child development and it's Chomsky's concept of language acquisition device. And according to this theory, all children are born with an instinctive mental capacity that allows them to both learn and produce language. So that's more of the nature side. If we look on the nurture side, empiricist child development theory, we all heard of Albert Bandura, hopefully. Or I know I have. If you haven't, I, I've considered doing some, some of his stuff or talking about some of the things he's done and the experience he's done. But he was a proponent of the social learning theory. And it says that people learn by observing the behavior of others. And he also has the famous Bobo doll experiment where he demonstrated that children could learn aggression, could learn um, aggressive behavior simply by observing another person acting aggressively. So, of course, there are, of course, there are limitations to both of those. But this really shows that some of the early psychologists kind of, um, stuck to one side as well. Now, like I said, the more contemporary view is that they are both on equal playing field when it comes to nature versus nurture. I want to go back to the twins because this is going to play a big role in what we're going to talk about next with the three identical strangers. So now this 
was something written that I found. I'm trying to see who who wrote this. Maybe I can find it towards the end. But this person that wrote this article had twins, okay? And they were delivered by emergency C-section. They were both boys. And in the beginning, they noticed a behavioral difference. So twin A, who had been pushed against an unyielding pelvis for several hours, spent most of his first day alert and looking around, while twin B, who had been spared his pre-birth stress, slept calmly like a typical newborn. So this person and their their husband, they did their best to treat them equally, but twin A was more of a challenge to hold, while twin B was easily coddled. And as they developed, they saw other differences. So twin B rehearsed all the ambulatory milestones. So crawling, walking, cycling, skating, etc. While twin A would watch and then copied the skill when it was mastered. So although they shared all the genes, so they were identical twins, and grew up with the same adoring parents, there were differences in in the two twins, and that their birth experience had been influenced both prenatal and postnatal. So, very interesting. And here's the thing. There have been many other studies of thousands of identical and fraternal twins that have both been reared together, so raised in the exact same household, and have made it possible to access relative contributions of genetics and environments to a large number of characteristics. So certain things are trait specific and then certain things are more environmental. There have also been studies that have shown that gender differences um, influence genetics. So there was a study of 4,000 pairs of twins in Sweden and they found that genetics had a stronger influence on sexual orientation in male twins than in female twins. The next thing we're going to talk about is called the three identical strangers. This is a roller coaster of a ride. When you, when you, I would recommend anyone to watch the documentary because it is just insane. So this was a documentary about three identical male triplets. And they were all separated at birth, okay? And so there were some similarities, like they made, like they were adopted through a Jewish, I guess, um, adoption center. It was a Jewish adoption center in New York, okay? And they were each separated, given to three different families. And none of those families knew that the child they were adopting was a twin or triplet. That was not disclosed to them. Now, they were, in order to receive the child, had to approve of having people come and observe the children from time to time and things like that, or their child from time to time. And in in these studies, it really showed the differences and also the genetic similarities of them. Um, There was also stability about mental illness. So you had one child who was raised in a author by an authoritarian father who was and they were also very poor and so he had kind of a lack of love in the home um a father who was more traditional um in the role of like beating the children and things like that and the other two one was middle class and one was upper class they were both raised with more nurturing and warm parents So this documentary really shows you the effect of mental illness on they're each raised in kind of different environments, different social economic statuses, different families and the way they raise them. And another condition of every single family was that every single one of them had a had a sister in the home that was older. I want to talk more about their story because I will say I, I don't want to spoil anything because I really want you guys to watch the documentary. But it does show how mental illness um, had an effect. And then just their journey of finding each other is really interesting. It's crazy. And when they all three found each other, 
the the family that I think were middle class or upper class kind of like adopted all of them. Not like legally, but had all three of them were there at all times. And the parents, both two, the two sets of parents that were upper that were upper class and middle class, both said if we knew the kid we adopted was a twin or a triplet, we would have taken all three. So they were all purposely separated in order for scientific experiments to be for it to be a scientific experiment, pretty much. And in the film, you see throughout their childhood that people would come and write notes and observe their behavior and what is crazy is there would be at certain times so one instance one of the boys was outside on his pogo stick and there was another scientist at another location with one of the other boys who was also outside on a pogo stick at the exact same time. So there are some crazy similarities, but you also see the way that the environment shaped them and how the the two that were in better homes, they were both in college and they were more sociable, whereas the other one felt more lost and struggled more with mental illness. So let's talk more about this because it is such a sad story. And what really frustrates me about this is it's completely unethical to separate twins. And secondly, they pretty much disbanded this place and they tried to, they kept the documents under lock and key so no one can really even know what the results were. Which is crazy. If you're going to do, we, we've covered unethical experiments in this podcast. And unfortunately, it happened, especially in the past. At least give us the results. Like, it's almost like it was done in vain. Like, ugh, it just, it, it frustrates me because we could at least learn something from it. So these boys, they kind of became famous too because um, when they found, two of them found each other and then there was something in the newspaper and then the third one came forward. And they were also um, on TV at some point, like on the news, just showing how miraculous it was that they found each other. So let's talk about how they, I want to try to see, I I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything. Two of them discovered each other first. They had an ad in the, it wasn't an ad in the newspaper. It was like a story on how the two discovered each other and the third one came forward. And it's, it's crazy. So the two of them that found each other, they, they, they found out that they were both adopted, that they were they were twins. They were born on the exact same day in the exact same hospital. And then months later, they found the third, um, who also had the same circumstances of adoption, the same place, born in the same hospital, and that they were all they were identical triplets. So they found themselves alike in many ways. They celebrated their newfound brotherhood. Um, Some of them even said how they felt lost for so long um, or they felt like something was missing. They had the same taste in food, smoked the same brand of cigarettes, and they all wrestled in high school. And they all showed signs of separation anxiety in children, um, as children. Um, So they quickly became a minor media sensation. They appeared on talk shows such as the Phil Donahue show, they moved in together. They opened a restaurant named Triplets, which they operated together. And they had all been involved as children in a study by psychiatrist Peter B. Neubauer and Viola W. Bernard. And they were under the auspices of the Jewish Board of Guardians. So this involved periodic vi- visits and evaluations of the boys, kind of like what I said. And the full intent was never explained to the adoptive parents either. The adoptive parents were saying, oh yeah, we're going to come and like evaluate and observe them in the future. But they were never told it was because of this big conspiracy of an experiment. And that they were separated from one another. When the boys kind of found each other, um, the parents were seeking more information from the adoption agency that they got the children from. And they claimed that they separated the boys because of the difficulty of placing triplets in a single household. But honestly, the upper class and the middle class said we would have adopted all three. So that was completely irrelevant. 
And upon further investigation, it was revealed that the infants had been intentionally separated and placed with families having different parenting styles and economic levels to be human experiments. And so one was blue collar, one was middle class, and then one affluent, so upper class. During the documentary, the question is asked by the siblings if perhaps they and any other sets of twins involved in this study were chosen because their parents have reported signs of mental illness before having children. But one researcher interviewed denied this flatly, saying the research was simply about parenting. Over time, differences among the three did become apparent. Their relationship with others had some difficulties. All three of them did actually struggle with mental problems for years. But one of them was the one that was raised more blue collar in a harsher parental environment. Had a harder time adjusting. So results of the experiment never have been disclosed by the adoption agency or the psychiatric team. Oh, you'd think we would get some results. Like they did this horrible and ethical thing and the least we could get because it happened was we could at least use those results for science for good and try to find stuff out. And I know that the parents have tried to get the documents and they had a lot of struggle. And so at the end of the documentary there, the text did explain that two of the boys um, or their families, they had been granted access to heavily redacted records of the experiment as a result of the documentary. So this documentary kind of pushed them to release some documents, of course, very heavily redacted. So the Neubauer twin experiment, it was first publicized in a 1995 New Yorker article by investigative journalist Lawrence Wright, who also appears in the film. The same never published twin study was the subject of 2007 memoir, Identical Strangers, written by Elise Sheen and Paula Bernstein. Um, Those were also twins that discovered each other. They appeared in the same film. And they were subject of the 2017 documentary, The Twinning Reaction, followed by the 2018 television episode, Secret Siblings. So this happened to many sets of twins, or even in this case, triplets. And it's crazy that we don't have results. But even watching the film, you you see the similarities and you see the differences. So this really does play into the nature versus nurture debate. And unfortunately, twins are usually part of these type of studies because especially with identical, we know they share the same exact genetic code. So how much of that genetic code plays in a part versus the environment that they are raised in? And even in the one kind of article I was reading about, the lady who had identical twins and had a difficult birth, had a cesarean, and one of the boys was more stressed out in the womb and couldn't really, was kind of stuck and couldn't really get through the pelvis, versus the one that was just taken right out, how they were even different. So it really just goes to show, like, which one is true? Or are they both? That we know that they play both play a part. And in some of my academic classes, when we've done discussion posts, they've always asked, which one do you believe in more? Or is it, or if you had to take a side. But everyone is, it's such a hard thing because we all know that they both play a part. So just very interesting. That is nature versus nurture. Nature's genetics, nurture's environment. And with anything psychology, it plays a part. You see it when it comes to mental illness. You, there's this genetic disposition or this person had head trauma or they were raised in this way. So either factor is never fully dominant or fully true. And even in medical, like we know, like I talked about diabetes, heart disease, things like that. You may have the genetic disposition. Um, when I talked about fraternal twins, Hyperovulation is a genetic disposition. Another interesting fact about fraternal twins, a lot of people say, oh, it skips a generation. But when you think about genetics, usually it's the father who carries the gene, and of course they're not a woman, so they don't ovulate. 
but they can pass that gene down to their daughters. So a lot of people say, oh yeah, twins in my family, they skip a generation or whatever. Really, it doesn't really skip a generation because um, if it runs on the paternal side, like that, the father still carries the gene. It's a carrier and then the daughter can have an expression of the gene. My father was a fraternal twin and ironically, his um, mom and aunt were identical twins. My sister has one son. And so what is my likelihood of having twins? Something I think about often and that's why we're holding off on, on kids for a bit. Want to be a little bit more stable in life first because of that risk. So that's all I have about nature and versus nurture. What did you guys think? Do you have any stories of nature versus nurture or examples you can bring to the forefront? So with that, I'm your host, Katie Gonzalez, and you're listening to What the Psychology. Stay psyched, y'all.